Hi everyone. A hands-off experience in flying airplanes. Well, you might say, that's what I usually have when I take a flight. The pilots are the ones <laughs> who have their hands on the controls, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true, obviously. But uh, things might change. Uh, the hands-off experience I want to talk to you about today um, is what some people experienced earlier this year in uh, this flight simulator. It is located uh, at the Institute of Flight System Dynamics of Technische Universität München, where I'm currently um, working as a PhD student. And hands-off really is meant literally. As you can see in this photo, the pilot's hands did not touch the control stick. The simulated airplane was controlled not manually, but by brain activity only. The pilots were using a so-called brain-machine interface. Such a device cannot read thoughts, but it can detect specific brain activity patterns. Such characteristic patterns appear, for instance, when you imagine movements of your left or right hand. Now, we can visualize these patterns by some colorful circles that represent the scalp, and this is actually what the computer can detect online, not with 100% reliability, but well enough to do some cool experiments. Other researchers have already shown that computer cursors or even quadcopters can be controlled using brain-machine interfaces, but the experiments that we conducted in Munich together with our partners, um, Team FUPA of TU Berlin, took place in a highly realistic environment in this flight simulator and also involved highly realistic tasks. One task was a landing approach in bad visibility. The pilots controlled left and right movements of the airplane with the brain-machine interface. Everything else was done by the autopilot. And when they were in the clouds with the airplane, they were guided by a radio signal. But we altered this radio signal so that when they came out of the clouds, they found them displaced to the left of the runway. And they had to fly a sequence of turns just before touchdown. Now, this was the last task we presented to each pilot, and it was the most difficult one. During our experiments, I shot the following video, and it starts just a few seconds before the aircraft comes out of the clouds. You can see the pilot on the left wearing an EEG cap that is used to measure his brain activity. And he has accomplished this task really well up until now, which is why the aircraft is at the position it should be. It's left to the runway. You can see the runway just on the upper right hand um, of the screen. Um, on the bottom right, you see the control stick as it is moved by the flight control system following the commands of the pilot. It took some time for him to maneuver the airplane into the right direction, and the aircraft movements are a bit shaky. But he, he succeeds well, and he, he aligns the aircraft with the runway now. Now the runway directly ahead of him. Now he just needs to fly in straight. And touched on. <laughs> you know, th there's a saying, um, every landing you can walk away from safely is a good landing. <laughs> so uh, this was a good landing. It was, a, it was amazing, and it, w it was breathtaking, and it, it still is to me. Uh, I don't want to hide that other pilots did not perform as well, that some um, really only flew in circles, but 
Um, after, after all um, the, the hard theoretical work, all the preparations leading up to these experiments, witnessing this successful landing approach, this landing, um, made, me, made me really happy. Um, so, wh where did all this originate from? Um, the idea for, for the EU-funded project Brain Flight came up in Portugal between um, the aerospace innovation company TechEva and the Neuroscience of Action Lab of the Champalimau Foundation. And further project partners were um, the IT innovation company Eagle Science from the Netherlands and uh, the Technical University of Munich and the Institute of Flight System Dynamics. Now, let's move on to, to a very typical TED presentation slide. <laughs> why? Yeah, why should we control airplanes with our brain activity only? Isn't manual control working well enough? Well, first of all, for manual control, pilots need to be in a good physical condition. With brain control, however, even physically disabled people could fly. So we could enlarge access to aviation. On the other hand, we hope, we think, that brain control could make flying more intuitive and thereby easier. Now then it would require less training and it would also be safer. Now that sounds great. When will we have brain controlled airplanes in service? Well, that's difficult to foresee, but I think we may see this any time between in a few decades or never. <laughs> Today we simply cannot predict if brain control of airplanes will ever become technologically feasible, if it will have the desired advantages over manual control, at which costs it will do this, and whether the pilots as the users and society, that is you as potential passengers, will accept it. So much about brain-controlled airplanes. I could end my presentation at this point, but one motto of today's event is dare to question. And there's one question that, although rarely asked, is highly interesting because the answer to it reveals the actual potential of this research. Let me ask that question. Why do we today aim for a far goal, brain-controlled airplanes, that we are not even sure to ever achieve? Why don't we take small steps, creating everyday applications, applications for the physically disabled, going step by step to this far goal? Well, this bottom-up development is already taking place, and things will go that way. But our interdisciplinary collaboration, engineers, neuroscientists, can create new paths new paths that may facilitate existing developments or that can lead to new endeavors. <clears throat> Instead of linearly progressing in separate domains, we combine existing knowledge to open up a new space for future research and development. Now let me illustrate this from my perspective as an aerospace engineer. This photograph shows Wilbur Wright during a flight test with the 1902 glider in the year 1902. And with this glider, with this airplane, the Wright brothers were able to do something they couldn't do with previous designs. They could turn left and right. Indeed, one of the aviation pioneers' main concerns right after how can we become and stay airborne was, how can we control our flying vehicles? Today we're not aviation pioneers anymore, but we still push the limits. Aircraft now have a purpose, and pilots have tasks to achieve. Mere controllability isn't enough anymore. Pilots fly passengers around the globe, put out forest fires, do search and rescue missions, military operations, or stunning aerobatic maneuvers. Now, for all these tasks to be achievable, 
with the least possible effort, aircraft handling qualities must be designed accordingly. You can compare this to your experience of driving cars. Compare a, a sports car to a family van. You want the sports car to, to be agile and aggressive, and the family van to be comfortable and, and easy to handle. Now, in aviation, the questions of controllability and handling have always been present. And then we when we think about brain control of any device, then very similar questions reappear. So instead of starting from scratch, we can take advantage of the knowledge already existing and thereby boost the development of brain-controlled devices for, for everyday use. Now, this knowledge transfer also works the other way around. When we speak about controllability and handling, the human operator, the pilot, obviously plays a crucial role. And it's not the pilot's haircut that matters, right? It's his dynamic behavior. So to us engineers, I'm sorry, um, pilots sometimes are nothing more than a block diagram. <laughs> now, of course, such a model, such a dynamic pilot model, does not perfectly represent the real human being, but it helps us engineers designing airplanes with good handling. This model basically describes two things the central nervous system, so basically the brain, and the neuromuscular system, so the muscles. Now, in the case of manual control, we can only observe both parts together as a whole. In the case of brain control, the neuromuscular system is not involved anymore. So we can have a look at the other part of our model, of our block diagram, and we can improve it. We gain a better insight into the human dynamic behavior, which is also useful in the case of manual control, of airplanes, of cars, or any other machine. Now, these were only a few examples of how interdisciplinary collaboration can create much more than just the obvious. But although we know that, it can be incredibly difficult to get people from different domains talking with each other, talking with each other in the same language. It takes people who accept that what they've learned and what they do every day as their profession is not the ultimate truth, that there are other ways of thinking. To me, interacting with people who think differently is the key to exciting discoveries not only in science and engineering, but in our everyday life as well. Thank you.